maybe. Hi, everybody. This is Kate Haley with Glazer's Camera here in Seattle, Washington. Thank you for joining us for PhotoFest. Uh, this is our eighth day, and we have just a couple more days left. There are great opportunities for you to take advantage of some promotional offers available. You should have gotten an email about those if you registered for the events. And if you haven't registered yet, there's still time to take advantage of those promos. Just go register now at glazersphotofest.com and you'll get that email in the morning. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about uh, creating time lapses with Jameson Ford, who works with Fujifilm. So Jameson, can you tell us a little bit about you and your role at Fujifilm? And then I'll have one more sure. announcement before we go into your session. Okay. Yeah, great. definitely. So I am one of the uh, PTS or product technical specialists uh, that travels around the country. So you've probably seen one of my counterparts at an event at your store. Uh, we we travel all over. We play with toys. We teach people how to play with toys. It's it's a pretty good gig. I can't complain. Um, my personal experience did the whole college photography thing and worked freelance for a while and art direction in, in that whole area. Uh, and then I got on with Fujifilm a couple of years ago. And so now I just travel around. So we are, our roles pretty varied. So we'll do everything from just your basic technical support, figure out how to set certain things to um, how to do things like the time lapse. Everybody kind of has their thing they specialize in or some stuff they enjoy more than others. So yeah, I, I travel a lot. Well, I used to. Right. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and then take a take a lot of pictures. So yeah. I just like photographing. Okay, great. Um, before we get started, I just want to let you guys know if you have questions about time lapse photography, um, even settings on if you have a Fuji camera, where you might find that. Um, this isn't going to be just for Fuji film shooters, but um, you know we can help you out with those menu settings for sure. Um, we're going to focus on the topic of creating time lapses. And uh, if you have questions, please be sure to just post those in the comments on the Facebook live feed or in the YouTube chat room. And we'll ask as many of those as we can. We only have a 45 minute session today, so we will be wrapping up right at 1245. Uh, so we may ask some, but maybe not get be able to get to everybody's questions, but we'll do the best we can. So with that said, Jameson, why don't we go ahead and roll right into your presentation and uh, get started. All right, all right, all right. Let me open up. So I'm going to go ahead and share right there. Uh, open, yeah, mm, mm, oh, sorry. I apologize, everyone. My uh, computer had a minor freak out just before I got here. So, you know. As one does, fun. right? <laughs> <laughs> Far for the course. So, all right. Let, let's go into presentation with you. There we go. All right. So my name is Jameson Ford. Like I said before, um, I travel around and take pictures. I just like to create things. So I got into time lapses uh, because I had never done them before. And I like to find things that um, areas of photography, different styles that I'm not super familiar with and just force myself to get familiar with them. So a couple of years ago, I just started doing time lapses all the time. So it, uh, so, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes. Hopefully you can learn from those and you don't make quite as many. So time lapses are, if you're not familiar with them, they are essentially videos created over a long period of time and then compressed in playback. So this can turn minutes, hours, or even days, or sometimes months, you know, even longer into just a matter of seconds. So your typical video is going to take maybe 24 frames a second. Well, let's say I take a picture, one picture every hour. Well, at the end of a day, I've got 24 pictures. That's one second of video. So I'm going to have to go 60 days to get 60 seconds of actual usable video. So it, it just compresses things and it can show processes that might be too long to show real time. It can speed them up. So you can use it for dramatic effects, funny effects. It's, it's, just a whole new avenue of being creative. Uh, that one didn't load. So basic equipment that you will need, a tripod, obviously. So you want a stable service to set the camera on, then an intervalometer, which I'll go into that. Your intervalometer is gonna be what triggers the camera on a certain time frame. Uh, most cameras will have those internally. Uh, you can also get an external intervalometer if needed 
it can, might give you some features that the internal doesn't. However, especially with the mirrorless stuff, uh, you know, Fujifilm, obviously, but a lot of the other brands too, we really have put a lot of thought into what the cameras can do internally. Uh, you'll want charge batteries. Absolutely. Considering you could be photographing on repeat for hours at a time. So a lot of charge batteries, formatted memory cards. Again, I know that pain of getting 1200 shots in and going, Oh, that's right. I forgot to format this and it's halfway. It was halfway full when I started and I got to try to hot swap and keep my time frame the same and keep the interval on time. And then a plan. These are very time. It's a very time consuming endeavor. So making a mistake after sitting still for two and a half hours because you didn't take something into account. It's, it's awful. It's a pretty terrible feeling. So you want to, you do want to think ahead and kind of plan what you're doing. Okay. So extra credit things that can make it easier aren't totally necessary, but I like to use them. Uh, you'll have a mo mobile app, which I'll kind of go into in the next slide. Uh, that, that can make it really easy to plan, to know how the sun's going to move, what the weather's like. Uh, it can also calculate all of your intervals and your times for, for doing the actual time lapse. If you want to add moving or movement to your time lapses, you can look at uh, moving heads, so robotic heads from Syrup, from Eldercron, from there's a, a bunch of different brands that have them. There's very basic ones. If you got a small GoPro, you can glue it to an egg timer from Ikea, but it all kind of works. But that can add a little bit more dynamic uh, motion. It can make, I'm sorry, it, it can make the time lapse a little bit more dynamic by adding panning, tilting, sliding, which is going to be your dolly. So your, uh, you know, your forward, backwards, your truck, side to side kind of movement like that. Uh, your ND filter, circular polarizer. So a lot of this stuff, it's, it just, it keeps the same photographic principles you would for still photography. So your circular polarizer does the same thing. Your ND filters do the same thing, but you kind of use them to create certain effects, which I'll go into. And then an external trigger. So your external trigger can be anything that you might use for lightning photography. So your optical trigger, uh, it could potentially be a radar or laser or a movement trigger, although that'd be a little bit more sporadic. Generally, I say like an external trigger you'd, you would look at if you're trying to do time lapses of a lightning storm, but you'd get a bit sporadic with your exposure. So you would have to, or with your interval times. So you would have to kind of regulate that, but it can definitely help. So, Real quick, tripod, obviously. If I'm doing a time lapse, I have used smaller tripods, but because it's going to be over such a long period of time, if I'm not traveling somewhere, I do, or it's not extremely difficult, I do try to bring a bigger, heavier tripod. Um, carbon fiber, I, I like big tripods because sometimes I might want to have my camera 12 feet off the ground. I don't know. I just try to plan for whatever could happen. So I like the heavier tripods just because it, it kind of helps keep things a lot, especially if you have moving heads, it's just going to keep it way more stable, less vibration. There's going to be a lot less movement in there. And since your camera's going to be sitting there potentially for, you know, three, four, five hours, I just like it to really be secure. Um, your external, so you'll have your Fotex or any brand. I know you guys carry Fotex. Uh, the, that is an intervalometer. So it's going to be your standard cable remote to trigger the camera. You can also set an intervalometer. Now there's some, some parts about having an external uh, intervalometer can be really handy. Some of them let you do speed ramping. So if you need to speed certain parts of the video up, so decrease the interval time between each shot or increase it depending on what's happening because there can be kind of a change in the, in the process that you're watching. You can do that with some external intervalometers. But if you were just going to go, I think my camera. Yeah, so if you, if you were just going to go, if you're just going to go uh, pretty straightforward, I generally keep with the internal intervalometer, just because it's less, 
less that can go wrong, less things for you to forget. I get used to that. Uh, batteries, always, 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 especially if you're running the mirrorless stuff. Super excited that our XT4 has a bigger battery. That being said, uh, they still wear down. They still wear down. I mean, if I'm going to run uh, time lapse overnight for 12 hours, I can't expect any battery to last that long. So that's when you run into... Uh, if you have a vertical grip, you can hot swap your batteries. Uh, what's handy about the X-T4 is that you can hot swap your memory cards too. Oh, please. That's so awesome. I love that feature. But then you all, you'll also have your various batteries that'll just run to uh, power pack. So it's a dummy battery that just lets you run power to it. Or uh, we have an AC adapter for a lot of our cameras. However, a lot of the newer cameras, a lot of the newer mirrorless cameras, um, X-T4, X-T3, other ones from the other brands are all running USB-C ports now, which lets you do power delivery while the camera's on. So I can effectively get uh, a 20,000 uh, milliamp or you know, maybe a, maybe a 40,000 milliamp battery, and I can just use a USB-C cord, plug it in, and just keep it going that way, which is really, really super handy. And then you can actually, I've seen people daisy chain mul multiple of those power packs together. So, I mean, whatever you got to charge your phone, you can just plug all those in and just daisy chain them back to each other and just keep it running. Um, so then, so the, that definitely having consistent power is really good. And then empty memory cards. I tend to err on the side of caution. I bring more, more is better. Uh, I do, if I'm going to do a big time lapse, I have a whole process of, okay, I'm going to dedicate the next few hours of putting all my memory cards in and just making sure that all the stuff has been completely dumped and that none of it is new stuff. And then I format all of them. I don't like to have to, okay, go in, I'll format it that morning. No, I want them clean in the memory card wallet. So I just need to put them in and start going. Now the mobile app, there's a lot of mobile apps. I tend to like to use photo pills. Uh, it just, it just works for me. I find it really handy, but there are a few other ones. I believe Sunseeker, uh, th there's a lot of them out there. Most of them you're going to have to pay for if they have a ton of features. One of the reasons why I like photo pills is because it has your time-lapse calculator. It's going to let you calculate on a number of different uh, parameters. So if I want to know how many shots, what my interval time needs to be, like I need to take a shot every what three four seconds i can plug in how many shots total i want to take the length i want my clip to be um and then it calculates the rest or if i know okay i want i want it to be 24 frames a second uh i want it to be 48 uh seconds long of a clip it'll say okay then you're going to take uh, whatever, a couple thousand shots. It'll be over this or I'm, and I'm going to shoot for the next five hours. They go, okay, then you need to take it every whatever the interval would be in that instance. So I find that really easy because I would love to think I could do that in my head, but chances are I'm going to flub some of the numbers. So uh, it's just really handy to have that kind of set up and know where I'm going, like know exactly where I'm going. And you can actually use it to calculate the amount of memory that you'll need. So if you put in the actual uh, size of your raw file, they can say, hey, you're gonna use 128 gigs if you're doing X amount or whatever it is. But then it also gives you, like a lot of them, your features to use maps, to find out the trajectory of the sun, the sunrise, the sunset, where the moon's going to be, where the stars are going to go. It, it helps you just plan out a ton of stuff. I personally love that one. Um, I do not work for them. It's the one I use the most. Uh, if you have another one that you really love, totally use it. Go for it. And then the moving, moving robotic heads. I really like the syrup stuff. There are definitely other brands. I travel a lot, so size is kind of uh, a big deal with me. And so each of their little mini genie twos are the size of a puck. So I can screw them in, stack them on top of each other, and that little bracket doesn't take up any, any room. You can get one of those little pucks individually, but if you get both, it gives you panning and tilting. So you get two axis movement, and then you can get slider rails and add in a whole other dimension. And then 
yeah, that's, I mean, that's a big investment, which is awesome if you want to go for that. But for traveling, I found these to be great. There are definitely some other brands as well. It's just really about what you, what features you're looking for. Um, I'll say Syrup does have a really, really good app as far as being able to plan out everything and, and plan out your movements based on how many shots. And I'll get into it in a little bit. The One of the hard challenges with with moving heads is that you have to sync up your interval to when it moves. And there's kind of some variations with that. So then filter holders, that's kind of the extra thing as well. Um, I like being able to put ND filters on. I like doing some long exposure stuff. I typically don't do that many 15 second exposures. I tend to go towards the extreme. So if I'm going to do a long exposure, I'm going to push it 60 minutes, maybe a little longer. So I'm double, triple, quadruple stacking a certain amount of filters on there. But for time lapses, yeah, you might want to run either wide open and bright daylight, but you still want to get some motion blur for a certain effect, or you want to lengthen it out five, 10 second exposures, because that can really give it a dramatic feel. And then here, uh, optical triggers. So if you are going to shoot lightning or you are going to do something that is going to need some kind of trigger that isn't just you setting it, there's there's some really good ones out there. So that can be handy. All right. So calculations, things you need to figure out. So the interval, like I said before, that's the time between your images. That is going to depend on a lot of different, a few different things, I should say that. If I was going to do like a long-term project on a construction unit and I knew I could set up my camera and lock it up and provide constant power to it, in our cameras, the maximum length of time you can set in between each shot is 24 hours. That's one whole day. So then after 24 days, you've got one second of video. If you're doing 24 frames a second, if you're going 60 frames a second in your final clip, you don't even have half a second yet. So you can really stretch these things out depending on the on the plan. The shortest interval is one second. So that you, that's going to decide your time in between each shot. And there's a few. That's also that's going to depend on the movement of your subject and the frame rate you're going for. Number of shots in our cameras it goes up to 999. A lot of times I do just set it to infinity. I don't always know where exactly I'm going to want it to stop it. That's a little bit sloppy on my part. Um, I do plan and go, okay, I need to do 840 shots. Well, I'm going to set it to infinity just in case something really great is happening. The lighting is perfect. And I go, I'm going to let it ride. I'm just going to let it go and make this 30 second clip a one minute clip or give myself a little buffer on the back end to do some editing. So I'm not budding right up to the start and stop of the uh, clip once I put it all together. Your frame rate is your playback speed for the finished video. You're going to calculate that. Uh, I mean, kind of just personal preference. I usually shoot 24, 30 frames a second when I'm doing standard video. So if I want to mix this in with that, you want to match that frame rate just to kind of keep things flowing a little bit easier. But here's the, here's the difference with shooting video. Okay. It's, it's shot at 24 frames a second. There you go. We're 23, nine, eight, uh, whatever, if you want to get technical. So that's pretty well locked. You can try to alter the frame rate or work with mixed frame rates and video editing it can get a little dicey. That's a little bit more complicated, but let's say I shot 1200 shots, 1200 images, right? I'm going to put it in time-lapse and I decide, you know what? It doesn't need to be 24 frames per second. I'd actually like it to be 60. You can just do that on the fly. It just knowing what frame rate you might want makes it a little bit easier to calculate, but you're actually not really set in stone. And then your start waiting time and our cameras, other cameras may have this. I don't have tons of experience with the newer ones since I work for Fujifilm. Uh, the external intervalometers will do this as well. So if I am setting up for a sunrise shot and I don't want to get out of bed, I'm going to put it on like an eight or nine hour time delay, or I'm going to operate multiple cameras and one of them is going to be in a secure location. Boom. I'll put it on, you know, whatever time delay. And then the other one is 
one I'll be by or however you decide to set it up. It is a very handy feature for sure. So before I get that going, so your, your interval, like I said before, varies based on your shutter speed. So if I'm running a 30 second shutter speed, I can't have a 15 second. Well, I mean, you can, you don't want a five second interval. I would say, just like if you're doing a long exposure, you want to 10 second countdown. So take that into account. So if you are doing 30 second exposures and then you're only going to give yourself five in between, you're probably going to get a lot of shutter shake. So I tend to say, you know, give yourself a little bit of time record for longer, but you probably won't be running 30 second exposures. I mean, maybe I'm not going to define how you want to be creative. Uh, then the speed of your subject. If your subjects are moving quicker, you're going to have a shorter interval in between them. So if I have a really fast moving subject and I have a 10 second interval between it, I'm either gonna need to have a much slower shutter speed so that it adds motion blur and they blend together a little bit easier, or I'm gonna have to have a very, very, uh, well, I just have to have a slower shutter speed because if I have a fast shutter speed, there's gonna be a lot of chopping in between each shot and the thing's gonna move really choppy. So shorter intervals for faster shutter speeds or faster sub subjects, I should say. And then it also, your interval also depends on the length of the clip and how long you're gonna be shooting. And then the number of shots, obviously length of clip, desired frame rate. Your frame rate match existing video or just do whatever you want. So your starting time, don't wanna get up early. So here I wanted a little bit of motion, a little hiccup at the front, a little bit of motion in the cars. I had a fairly fast frame rate, I don't remember, or fa fairly fast interval time, short. I don't remember exactly what it was because it doesn't record in video metadata, but the cars were still moving so fast that you saw that they had that kind of jumpiness. So if I had slowed down the shutter speed a little bit, they would have blurred a, a little bit more. So that's something you want to play around with a whole lot. Okay. I will always set stuff manually. I've played around with built-in automatic uh, time-lapse functions and cameras that kind of just spit out a time-lapse ready to go. They're cool. They're great. Uh, they are going to hiccup sometimes. So I tend to say lock, lock everything in manual. Just, I mean, pretty standard photographic principles. Like you do it manually, you know exactly what you're doing. There's not going to be any surprises coming from the camera at least. So, so setting your camera manually, it's gonna be more consistent between each shot. Whereas the auto function, there can be some spikes or dips in the exposure, which can create some flickering effects. So I'll usually lock my aperture, my shutter speed and ISO based on whatever overall look. Okay, do I want some movement? Do I want some motion blur? Okay, I know I need to have a little bit of a longer shutter speed then I'll stop down or add the ND filters uh, or bring the ISO down, depending on the time of day. I generally lean more towards, I wanna to control things with my shutter speed and my interval time, the, the time between each shot and the aperture and the ISO kind of go a little bit more where they need to go. As long as I have a reasonable amount of depth of field, uh, if I want a lot of stuff in focus or it's really shallow depth of field, if I wanna create certain effects. so. I generally say focus on your shutter speed and your interval to kind of get the feel and the overall motion you want. Uh, ISO and aperture, yeah, like I said, they just work around that. So for changing lighting conditions, that's going to be probably the hardest one. I'll generally estimate about three to four stops under exposure for when I start. Okay, so before the sun rises, I'm going to say, all right, my meter's saying I'm three to four stops under that's totally fine because I, I basically wanted to hit about correct exposure as the sun is actually hitting the horizon or maybe a little over. And then by the time it's up in the sky, it'll start to be a little blown out. That's going to make it easier to balance the whole thing. Bring your, your, the middle or the beginning part of your video up, bring the final part of your video down a little bit and balance it a little bit. But you generally, I mean, naturally things are going to be darker and brighter. You don't want it all just being super flat the whole way across. You, you want it to kind of fade in from darkness. And that just is a lot more natural. I mean, nature, when it's night, it's dark, 
or, you know, before the sun rises. So that's just going to give it more of a natural feeling. I don't want everything exposed perfectly. So your automatic settings, or let's say you do it with an internal one, will kind of just make it all correctly exposed the whole way through. And that can end up feeling really uh, unnatural, a little bit weird. And then the ND filters can help to stretch out the shutter speeds. So if I want to add, in certain instances, if I want to add some motion to the branches or bushes or something like that, that's when I want to stretch out the shutter speeds, which I'll show you. So I believe this is the one that I shot in auto, if you all can see that. So what we'll see, you see the little flickering right there? Our cameras don't actually have, and so this was shot with an unnamed camera from a different company. Um, our cameras don't have built-in automatic intervalometer settings like that. We don't want to dictate how you use the tool. We don't want to do it all for you. So we're just going to give you the ability to do it. You compile it and post. We just kind of automate the process of it. That way you don't have to try and take a picture every five seconds. Okay, you have the tool. It automatically takes a picture every five seconds, whatever. But then you you go and compile it later so that you have complete control over it. If we do it automatically, there's just a lot that can go wrong with that. So then the top one set manually, which made it just a little bit smoother. Now you, you could still potentially get a few spikes here and there, but there's substantially less, there's less flickering. So here I actually drug out the shutter speed a little bit. Well, that's not what I wanted. There we go drug out the shutter speed to get the fog kind of moving. This is a shorter interval, interval, probably every three to five seconds because, or maybe six seconds because it was moving so fast. So really what I would want to do is, well, like that can be hard. I mean, that's where that balance is. If, if I want some motion blur versus a short interval, you kind of run into that because I obviously have a limited amount of time before the sun comes up. So I can't just say, well, I'll just let it run another hour. Well, the sun's already up. Shot's over. Okay. So certain instances, hmm, I want to say this was actually compiled with two cameras. One of them was done in camera and the other one was set manually. They were two different brands. One of them was Fujifilm. Leave it at that. So a lot of times with people, I tend to try to drag the shutter a little bit just because with how fast people are going, it can look a little choppy. They look a little bit too moving around. It, it tends to be a little bit more natural if they have just a slight motion blur. So bear in mind that if you're going by 180 degree shutter rule, if you're doing video, 24 frames a second, you're going to be at 48th of a second, right? So if everything shot at 48th of a second, there's going to be some natural blur to people moving around. That's not an exceedingly fast shutter speed. So I, I kind of take that into account when I do things like that, or when I do stuff like this. Uh, you want to load. So it's still pretty fast, but you can see some blur with the cameras. Now, some of the stuff combined, you can see a little hiccups around the exposure, around the uh, balloons, because that was done internally. Some of it was done manually, so you don't see that. So you can see how fast, there you go, there it is. You can see how fast the clouds were moving and obviously hot air balloons are not blazing fast, but I kept a pretty quick interval between them because if it had been every 30 seconds, that balloon, it wouldn't look as continuous. It would, hey, the balloon would be close and then it would be pretty substantially farther away and then it'd be further away, further away, further away. And I would miss my chance to really build a continuous, I would you know, only get a couple seconds of shooting and the balloon would just disappear real fast. Hey, Jameson, we're curious here. Yes. Where was that? Uh, where did you capture that at? That was uh, Forest Park in St. Louis. They okay. do the uh, hot air balloon race from Art Hill every year. Oh, cool. Except I think last year the wind was picking up too hard. So, mm. yeah. I've always wanted to uh, photograph something like that. I, uh, When I was living in Dubai, I went out for this early morning excursion in the desert, and we saw a couple of hot air balloons going up in the morning. 
So I got like photos as we were driving one way and the hot air balloons were the other way, but that's as close as I've gotten to one of those in a long time. So it looks pretty cool. Yeah. We- we always do the, um, if you get a chance, I mean, it is kind of a surreal thing. They do the uh, hot air balloon glow the night before the race. And a, a lot of places will do that. Yeah. So they go, everybody sets up the balloons, they're anchored in a field, and then they just start heating them up and they inflate them all and just the torches are going. It gives a pretty surreal glow to the whole situation. It's a ton of fun to just walk around. It's basically like being surrounded by like a hundred campfires in every direction. It's really cool. <laughs> That sounds pretty cool. Okay, I was just curious. We were curious here, so keep on, keep on. Yeah, on. absolutely. So this is this is actually that's I live like five minutes from Art Hill in St. Louis, so uh, I get over there. That's our art museum. Uh, so this is another instance of I added some motion with this. I believe this was just a panning head that I had at the time. It's a few years ago. So this this is where the hot air balloons took off. I was just I'm on the other side now. Turn off the noise right there. So you'll see because of the way the clouds are moving, that's kind of the hard balance is people, clouds can move pretty fast. I was going for smooth clouds. So the people are going to look really crazy. If I had sped up the, or shortened the interval between each shot to get the people to move a little bit slower because more frames per second, then the clouds would barely be moving at all. I was interested in the clouds moving more than the people. So there's that balance. You, that's why you have to, you have to kind of know the plan that you're working towards. So clouds aren't moving near as fast as people. So people, you want a shorter interval. Uh, clouds, you can stretch it out a little bit but it also depends on here. They're, they're kind of tightly packed in. So I could, it could be reasonably stretched out a little bit more. So here is an instance. So a sunset, just a short clip of it. I set it, the exposure, knowing that it would, you know, I wanted to be a little bit darker. That's the feel I wanted. And I wanted to drag out the shutter a little bit and knowing that it would fade almost completely to black. So here, watch the bushes or the, um, the grass on the beach right here. It gives a certain feel because it's moving really fast, but I wanted it to drag a little bit. I wanted that motion blur. If I had tried to shoot with a super high ISO 12,600 so that everything, I just keep a fast shutter speed and everything was frozen, there'd be this really harsh, jagged movement to it and that feels a little less natural. Okay. This was out at, uh, that was in Boca Grande, by the way, down in Florida uh, on the Gulf side. And then this is Red Rocks, just so everybody knows. Um, Yeah, I got really lucky. I, I headed out there one morning and the clouds were really low and there were clouds going across the tops of all the mountains out there just because I got there early. And then the sun came up right behind me. I, you know, I, I just got to a really good spot at the right time. The clouds were moving. They start, they definitely start to break apart and just disappear. Um, I think I shot this over probably an hour or so. So we'll see. So here again, I was shooting a a quick shutter speed or a quick interval. I think I would have been like F16 or so stopped down to get maximum depth of field with our 16 millimeter. I think this was the 16 to 80 or maybe the 10. No, this would have been the 10 to 24. So the clouds were moving pretty fast. Again, I wanted to have them some do some movement. So two seconds would have been too fast. Give myself five to six seconds so that I would have a fair amount of shots to kind of find my clip in the middle of all that stuff. (laughs) And then, you know, there was good shadow movement too. So, you know, I give myself kind of a middle range that probably would have been like five, six, maybe 10 seconds at most. Now the framing with this, it's, I guess I should talk about that too. It's, it's going to be the same as your, say your landscape photographs, you you want kind of a play between your your foreground and your and your main subject, your background, the sky, all of it. I found those bushes and the movements in them pretty interesting, so I wanted to frame it that way. I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't. There's not some special framing for this. You really are going to set it up. I I tend to though, 
I tend to set it up on a 16 by nine or uh, aspect ratio because I'm generally going to crop it that way. But because I'm shooting a still image, I'll still, I could still shoot. I don't need to have it JPEGs pre-cropped or anything. Um, I will still shoot the full size raw so that I can do a lot of editing with it. That being said, you do not, to, <laughs> side note, you don't have to do it in raw. Um, you can do it in JPEG and that could make one, just the overall like amount of space and memory this takes up, substantially reduce that, um, a little bit less editing because otherwise if it's in raw, I'm putting it into capture one. You can also do Lightroom. There's good plugins for Lightroom and then you're going to have to batch edit them and then kick them out as JPEGs from raw. I'm a sadomasochist. I'd like to do that. I want to control every single step. So I do shoot these in raw, uh, but it's, it's definitely not necessary. So here is an instance. <clears throat> Let me talk about this real quick. I added some movement in, in post, right? I had my raws. So I have a ton of resolution so I can crop in and then just add some panning or zooming in premiere, which is really handy. It's one of the reasons I like to shoot raw. Another part is because if your camera's on the tripod, yes, general practice, turn off the image stabilization. If you forget to do that, what happens? Um, if there's any movement at all and your lens's stabilization is on, you'll actually see some movement in the frame and it moves such a substantial amount that I, I had to crop in incredibly tight to try and match up all the frames and it still didn't perfectly match. I don't know if I actually included that in here. So this, I think, probably would have been like a 75% crop on the overall image. I mean, I just cropped in real tight so that I could come in from the edges and just get that center portion because of how much it moved. It's another reason why I like to shoot raw, because if I don't have the lens that can get me there or I want to add movement, I want to shoot a little bit wider and decide, since I'm at 16.9, if I want to be towards the top of the frame, the bottom of the frame, I might want to find a different frame in the picture I took. So this, okay, the, yeah, these are all from Red Rocks. This is an instance, um, having an ND filter definitely helps if you need to stretch out the shutter speed. Now, I wasn't worried about stretching out the shutter speed. I wanted to be wide open. This was with a Miticon 35 millimeter 0.95. It's an interesting lens. It's kind of fun to play around with. Um, it, gives, it gives an interesting look. I was mostly just curious, so I, I like to play with things. So. I want to set it at 0.95 to give it kind of a unique look. You can see the heavy, heavy vignetting, um, you know, just the way the lens built because it's 16, nine, you don't see all of the vignetting. Cause I, you know, chop the top and the bottom off. Now, normally if I was using standard DSLR, didn't have an electronic shutter, I would have to have an ND filter to be able to shoot wide open like this. Um, even at base ISO, your one sixties for us, one hundreds, anything like that. You're in the desert outside of Vegas. There was a ton of sun, but this, our, our cameras have an electronic shutter that goes up to a 32 thousandth of a second. So I was shooting at 0.95 at probably, I don't know, like 16 thousandth to 32 thousandth of a second, which was great. I mean, it's super handy, super handy because I got a really unique feel to it. And again, I like that there's some foreground there and I actually am going to get people walking through the trail there, but because they're not only just kind of like small and moving around really quick and jittery, but they're also out of focus, which gives it kind of a distinct, almost like a miniature feel. So one of my favorite things is I, I love adapt. I mean, obviously that Medicon has an X mount on it, but I also like adapting lenses. And I love the fact that if I want to use them like this, again, because we have, we have an electronic shutter. Again, we just want to give you the tools. We don't want to dictate how you use them, right? That's really awesome. Yeah, thank you. I think that was the one I already showed, right? Yeah, that one got duplicated. Okay, so, well... So this again, this was with the, the syrup, the panning heads. So one of the great things is you can start from your frame and then you can pan across. And so I'll talk about this. A lot of the, the moving heads will have the a feature where they can trigger your camera. So you actually don't do it internally. The intervalometer, you'll do it through the actual robotic heads, which is really handy because that way it can... 
when it's not moving. There's two ways of using a moving head. There's constant movement and then stop, shoot, move, stop, shoot, move, stop, shoot, move. If I'm running really fast shutter speeds, just for whatever reason, I don't care if my head is constantly panning the whole way because I'm going to freeze motion every time it, it fires. You don't really need the actual robotic head, the moving head to trigger your camera. But if you are running a little bit of a longer shutter speed and so you need the actual head to sit still, then you're going to want the head to actually fire it. So that's one of the handy things about the Syrup, the Mini Genies, is that I can calculate my interval based on that. So let's say I'm going to have a 10 second exposure. It'll sit still, it'll fire the camera, and then it'll count down 10 seconds and then it will give itself a second or two, and then it'll move. Then it will move back in. It will stop moving, give itself about two seconds so the camera can settle, and then it'll trigger the camera again, another 10-second exposure. And so it does that based on how far you want to move over what time frame. Hey, uh, hey, Jameson? So then you don't have to mess around with, okay, how do I get this to fire? I need to make sure that Okay, it's a 10 second exposure. So I want to set the intervals on the head to move every, let's see, 20 seconds. And then I got to get them to go at the exact same time. You know, and over time, that can kind of get a little wonky. <clears throat> hey, Jameson. Yes. Uh, we, we only have a few minutes left. So uh, okay. unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap our session up here. Um, sure. I got this is the last time lapse, literally. Okay. So this is a good demonstration of pan and tilt and moving with the stars. And there you go. So yeah, if there are questions, I will gladly answer them for could sure. You, could you talk a little bit, I know, I think you talked about shooting in RAW. Um, I know for mm -hmm. me, I'd recommend using uh, faster memory cards if I were gonna do this kind of work with uh, RAW files. And the benefits mm -hmm. of RAW files are obviously you get a lot more information that you can play around with. Um, so I guess some people might still be using JPEGs for this kind of work. What would what would be your, say, two or three tips on why RAW would be beneficial and then any recommendations you have with that in mind? Yeah, um, yes, RAW is going to take up a little bit more space. But in certain instances like this, um, you might not nail the exposure like dead on. And so you're going to have a lot more latitude to bring your shadows up, bring your highlights down, especially with your sunrises or any of any stuff with stars like that. Just being able to being able to kind of recover information or bring stuff out that you may have missed is really, really, really handy. So I like to shoot raw because of that. And then I also get to kind of play around with my colors a little bit and decide how I want to do that. Um, Memory is a lot cheaper than it used to be, so I'm not super worried about it. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think RAW just gives you an, uh, a much better buffer zone for right. being able to fix any mistakes that might happen, whether it's because some clouds cleared up, whether it's because you did your exposure wrong or you miscalculated something or whatever it is, you can recover more because you have the RAW stuff. Uh, as far as the cards go, bigger is generally better. Uh, I... 32 is the smallest I have. I'm usually 64, 128s um, as the prices come down. I will, even if you if you're running a super long interval, even if I'm running like a one hour interval time, I still like having the assurance that my card is going to be fast enough no matter what. So all my cards are UHS two uh, because I shoot a lot of video V60 or V90 generally. So okay. much much faster read write speeds. Okay, great. So unfortunately, we have run out of time because we have another session that starts right at 1 p.m. Um, so I just want to uh, thank you, Jameson, for being here and for Fujifilm yeah. for you being able to be here. Um, we, uh, we here, of course, love you guys. We love all of our vendor partners. Um, and uh, it's also really, really great to kind of pick up a couple more tips on time-lapse photography. Uh, for those of you tuning in, this session will be available to rewatch on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button so you can follow and get updates when we post new content. Uh, Jameson, thank you so much. Uh, for you guys who are tuning in, we'll be back at 1 p.m. with our next session. So hang out and join us for that. Thanks again, Jameson. You're very welcome. Have a good day, guys.